Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Mark, for your nice uh, introduction. And thank you very much for, you, for uh, hosting me here to give an overview about the Egypt and about the economic growth in Egypt. But before I start, I think I, I have my PowerPoint presentation in which I... Okay, so take your time out. And okay, this is the Egyptian flag then. I'm very proud to hold it. Thank you very much. So basically, uh, although I'm, a, I'm the executive chairman of the Egyptian Stock Exchange, and uh, some people might think that I will talk about the stock market, but the reality is that I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, something else. It's about the, the economic growth and about the concept, concept of inclusion growth and uh, how to link that to the latest development in Egypt. Uh, uh, and when we have the presentation now, uh, just to trying to mention very quickly that prior to 2011, which is the, the January 2011 with the 25th revolution in Egypt, uh, how the Egyptian economy was enjoying and how the uh, performance of the exclusive growth in Egypt was part of this revolution, actually. Because if we look to the numbers, in which in, in a second or a minute we'll have it here in the screen, you would understand that the Egyptian economy was enjoying a high level of growth rate. Actually, from the period from 2005 until 2011, in five to six years, the Egyptian economy was enjoying a high level of economic growth. We are talking on average between six to seven percent, which is by international standards is a high level of growth rate, and it was a sustainable one. Uh, but the reality is, if you look to the economists in which are, they are talking about the economic growth and the relationship between the three important parameters, actually, economic growth, poverty, and, uh, and equality in income distribution. And the reality is that there is a difference between a good growth and a bad growth. So the people now, they are not talking about the sustainability of the growth itself. And they are not talking only about the level of growth, whether you are growing by 5 or 6 or 7 percent. But more importantly, importantly, they are talking about the quality of growth. And accordingly, economists sometimes they are differentiating between the bad growth and the good growth. And the bad growth, when only few people of the, of the society, they are benefiting from growth. And the good growth is that you would like to make sure that everybody should benefit from growth. And this is why I bought this title, The Nonsense Numbers. The nonsense numbers happening when you have an economic growth, like for example, six or seven percent, while the reality is that not everybody is benefit, benefiting from growth. So the issue is not about the level of growth itself, but it's about the quality of growth and whether everybody is benefiting from growth or not. So the issue is that the nonsense number is economic growth is a misleading indicators. And here, through the revolution, the things I was talking about, you find that we have a stable and growing economic growth, around 6 to 7%. We have a large foreign direct investment. On average, we have between 8 to $9 billion, which is around 8.5% of our GDP, which is a high level by international standards. So the five years prior to the revolution, we used to have around $50 billion in terms of foreign direct investment. You know, the, in the IFC and the World Bank, they have something called doing business report. In these five years, Egypt always appears in the top 10. In 2007, Egypt was the ranked number one as a top reformer in the world. But everybody was expecting that if you have these things, that the entire society will benefit from growth. And this should have an impact on the poverty level, as well as on the narrowing the gap in terms of income distribution between rich and poor people. But the reality is that with this high level of growth, we have a high level of corruption. We have inequality in income distribution. I guess even before 2005, the Gini coefficient was some measure of the, the differences between poor and rich people, which is measured the inequality. It was around 32%, it became 35%. So the gap increased, not decreased. And the poverty went up from 22% to around 25%. And the unemployment was not that improving. 
And this is what we can call it sometimes the economics is a cancer of growth. So although you are have a sustainable and high level of growth, but it could be a bad growth as the situation happened in Egypt. And here some figures about the way you are growing. And, and as you can see, even during the financial crisis, when most of the countries in the world were lagging behind, most of them, they have a negative growth rate. Egypt was enjoying a reasonable growth rate around 47 to 4.8% during the financial crisis. And here, as you can see, we are building reserves. We went up from 14.8 billion US dollar to around 35 billion dollars just prior to the revolution. Foreign direct investment, as you can see, tripled compared to before 2005. And the exchange rate, the Egyptian pound was, was enjoying some sort of uh, 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 progress against the international uh, currencies. And the inflation rate even went down in 2009 and 2010. And here is the situation is about the exclusive growth versus the inclusive growth. So the theory and the practice, and there is something called the trickle down effect. The trickle down effect in economics in which you are believing that when you have a high level of growth rate, when you have a sustainable high level of growth rate, the rich people will invest more, they will create more uh, job opportunities for the poor people, and by the end of the day, everybody will benefit from the reform and everybody will benefit from this high sustainable rate of growth. This is, a, this is the theory in which the economists were talking about, and it is called the trickle down effect. But this is a practice. The reality is that it is not always working that way. And you can see from the other photo is that in many cases and in many countries, the poor people get what is left over from the rich people. So the poor people, they are not benefiting from growth. I have a very known example, India, for example. Uh, there are a club called the Club 13. The, according to the report by the World Bank and the IFC, there is a, a report on growth and commission uh, has been sponsored by the World Bank. The, and the, and the, they were talking about countries in, after the Second World War in which they were able to grow by at least 7% for the continuity of 25 years. And there are only 13 countries they were able to grow by at least 7% for at least continuity of 25 years. For example, India was one of them. But if you look to the India in which they were growing by 9, 10, 11% on average, but even though the inequality was increasing, the, 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 the gap between rich and poor people increased more and more. Why? Because there were no economic policies to put in place to make sure that this sustainable growth rate are distributed among all citizens. So the message here is that it could be some sort of a bad growth and a good growth. And now economists, they are not talking about numbers, but they are talking about the quality of growth to understand that everybody will participate and will take reasonable and justice and, justice and fair share from this economic growth. So this is a cancer of growth. 7% for five years, for every year, for, for the five years prior to the revolution. But even though the poverty rate increased in Egypt with this 7% growth rate, the unemployment was more or less stable or increasing, and the percentage of the extremely poor people were in increase. So it's very hard to believe a country achieving 7% growth rate annually, but even though we have these figures in a social dimension, which is called a cancer of growth. So the problem or part of the issue why we have the revolution in 2011 is that because people felt that only an elite uh, percentage of the population, they are benefiting from the, the, the reform and benefiting from the economic growth while the entire population were lagging behind. Besides, we have some structural issues like the educational problem, fuel subsidies, and this is one of the important issues, for example, about the subsidy policies in Egypt, in which you find that Egypt is a, more or less it's a poor government or a, a poor country, but subsidizing the rich people. 40% of subsidy are going to the rich people, not going to the poor people because of the bad distribution of the subsidy. Procracy, as well as using the public sector to provide jobs to uh, support the politicians. And this is what's happened. The revolution, Tahrir Square, and I think many of you are aware of that, and there are no 
the Tahrir Square became a famous place in which the revolution started in 2011, actually. And what's happened after the revolution, and the, here is another problem, because a part of the revolution is that we have a very radical change in our political system. And everybody believes that we are moving from the dictatorship to a democracy. And uh, the, the, the bad impression or the wrong impression that the uh, citizen at large got it from this revolution is that since we were able to change our political system, since we are moving to democracy, since we have radically changed in our political system, why not we will have the same thing in our economic system? We're talking about a country grown by 7% prior to the revolution with this high level of corruption. So they said, okay, very easily, if we were grown by 7% with all these problems, we can grow by 8, 9, and 10%, and everybody will benefit from the reform. And again, it's about the issue about the trickle-down effect in economics in which we are talking about. There's something I can say it's like a trickle-down effect in politics. I mean, democracy, you can it became a democratic country between a day and night. And that, I think, was the biggest mistake in our society, especially from the media, from the politician, in which they give the Egyptian people the impression that we are moving to a democratic society, same like in the United States, Japan, France, Germany, UK. And the people believed in that and said, OK, since these countries are able to change their leaders, to have a, a freely elected president or prime minister, and you will have the same situation. Why not in our economic system will be the same as well? And everybody was dreaming about this, and the media were fueling the same concept among the people. But the reality was actually in the other way around. In the three years after the revolution, the Egyptian economy lost the direction instead of growing between 6 to 7% on annual basis, we were growing between 1.8 to 2%. And for a country like Egypt, it's a very bad news. Might be it's a good news for Japan, might be a good news for Europe, but a country like Egypt in which we have an employment rate of 13.4%, a country like Egypt in which the population is 90 million, a country like Egypt in which we have like 800,000 newcomer to the job market, you need at least between 6 to 7% to at least sustain your current unemployment rate. So 2% is a very bad news for Egypt. But the reality, the reality is that after the revolution for three years now, we lost direction, and our economic growth went down by two-thirds. Instead of 6 or 7%, we're growing between 1.8 to 2%. We lost half of our foreign reserve. We, before the revolution, it was between 35 to 36 billion US dollar. Now we are talking be, uh, between 16 to 17 billion dollar. Even after the, uh, the the aid from Gulf countries, in which I think after, especially after the second revolution, we got around 12 billion dollar actually. Foreign direct investment, after we're talking about 10 billion every year, 11, 13, 8 we're talking about 1.2 or 2 billion dollars because of unrest in our political system. Budget deficit, very bad news about the budget deficit. It went up from 8 to 9 percent to around 13 to 14 percent. And if you are studying economics, it's very hard to believe how we can grow or, if you have, or have, how you have an economic growth while your budget deficit between 13 to 14 percent. And of course, the exchange rate went up the devaluation in the Egyptian currency. And poverty increased. Even we're complaining before that, that five years before the revolution that we have a sustainable growth rate, but the poverty rate was going up. It went up even more after the revolution to around 26, 27%. Unemployment rate went up from 9% to around 13% because the, the reality that the country did not have a sustainable or a nice growth rate after the revolution. So, What's about the future? This is what we are talking about. Now we have, if everybody here uh, uh, could get this information, that we have the first revolution in 2011, and then we have an election in which the brotherhood was controlling the country, only for one year, and then we have a second wave of the revolution. So just last June 2013, we have the second wave of the revolution. We outset a second president in which now Egyptians talking, okay, we are the first country in the world to 
cake to present in a couple of years, which is something I don't know why they are proud of. But the reality is that they will become sort of the revolutionary kind of activities. They would like to go to the street more often. They would like to protest most of the time. They would like to strike. But the reality is that you cannot run a country for a long period of time with this kind of uh, uh, conceptual framework. But still, the things we were co complaining before about having an exclusive kind of economic growth, now we need to have a roadmap of how to have an inclusive growth. And to have an inclusive growth, we need to have a sustainable kind of growth, to mean have a maintainable growth that does not create problems, especially for future generations. So we're talking about these three dimensions now, about the viable economies in which we need to limit the speculation in the economic system to eliminate poverty and to promote efficiency in our ecosystem. Social responsible economies in which we need to limit the corruption in which we were complaining between 2011 and to promote justice. And if you understand what was the slogan of the 20, 2011 the revolution was, I think it was justice, freedom, and bread. This was the slogan of the revolution in Egypt. And of course, the environmental sound economies to limit destructive production and to limit waste uh, of the our production. But uh, very easy to be said, very difficult to be implemented. So how to do that? We need to have first a strategic thinking. We need to have a coherence of a political parties in which you are complaining from that now because now after the revolution, we have like 80 plus parties, very small parties, nobody knows about them. They do not have any ground in the street, but every group of people, they have a party now. But we do not have like two, three very strong parties that can compete, and they have a very clear, clear program of how to drive the country forward to the objectives of the revolution. We need to have a long-term strategic plan to reassure investors of the stable business environment, which is very important because this country cannot grow based on the government assessor, but it should depend on the private sector and the part of that from the international investors, and to address the security concerns. So you cannot talk about economics unless you have a stable political system as well as a stable security system. Long-term investment, of course. You cannot talk about economic growth without having a vision of a long-term investment, especially in infrastructure, healthcare, education, training, and of course, research and the development. Supporting innovation, which is a part of the themes here, and this is very important between, because sometimes you need to think outside the box. You cannot continue the same routine you have, but you need to be innovative in your ideas. ideas. You need to be innovative in your economic system, and you need to be innovative of how to put the country again on track. To generate solutions of how to bring the budget deficit down to a single digit instead of double digit, for example. So you need to bring it down from 13 to 14% to around 8, 9% at least for the time being. You need to think how to deal with the issue regarding to subsidy. And we have to learn from other countries' experience whether we need to move from the in-kind subsidy to the cash subsidy, for example. And as I told you, 40% of our subsidy bill going to support rich people. And you need to think about how to increase your revenues from taxes that are against rich people, but they are supporting the poor people. For example, there are some countries doing something called airtime taxes for using mobile services, for example. Encouraging entrepreneurship and SMEs, and this is very important issue because if you would like to create a middle class people, if you would like to support the poor people, you need to encourage SMEs. And if you look to the structure of the Egyptian economy, you will find around 70 to 75 percent of our GDP is coming from small and medium-sized enterprises. And you'll find around 70 percent of our employment is going from SMEs. So SMEs actually is a vehicle for the economic growth in Egypt, but they do not have illegal parent, as we can see. So we need to have a policy to support small and medium-sized enterprises, for example. And you need to have inclusive planning. 
And what I mean by inclusive planning is that the decision-making process itself needs to be very clear and in a coherent manner. You need to give opportunity to the young people because the people who went to the street in 2011, most of them, they are young people, 15, 20, 25, 28, 30 as a maximum. And you need to have justice and inequality among the citizens of the country. And of course, you need to take care of the rural area development. But the most important thing is about communication. Communication, communication, communication. The problem we face it is that you are raising the expectation of the people with no ground. If you are talking that about the economy will grow with a certain percentage. If he says that we are solving the problem with health, education, and you do not have sufficient resources. If he says you will bring the budget deficit down and you are sure that you will not be able to bring it down. Don't raise people expectations. You need to disclose and to be very much transparent when you are talking to the citizen at large. I mean, any pol politicians or any policy maker in the future will not be able to deceive the citizens anymore. And the big failures we have so far in our society is that you are raising the expectation of the people. You are not telling them the truth, is that you need to suffer around five to 10 years before you be able to bring this country on track, before you have a decent life. But if you said, okay, in a six month we'll deliver that, and you know that you will not be able to deliver that. You are raising the expectation of the people. And this is why after the revolution, we have a six government. And the current government, which is, has been formed only a week ago, is because every other government was raising the expectation of the people. And in the beginning of the program, they giving a very decent promises. After two, three months, people get fed up because they see nothing on the ground. So the very important message for the new government and the new president, which should be elected soon in a couple of months' time, is to be more transparent with the people and tell them the truth, the challenges, challenges and to make them part of the decision-making process so that you will not give promises with no grounds that you will not be able to deliver these promises. And last but not least, about the sustainable of Egypt, we need to see this light to be, at the end of the tunnel, a light, not a train coming. And the better future for the majority and the good life for all, not only for the few. Thank you very much.